Graham Vincent, violin maker and musician. Uh, if you've seen any of my previous videos, you'll know that I've been um, very keen to find a substitute for ebony. And it's something that I've been working on uh, for a long time, really. And uh, for the last couple of years, I've been making violins using a sort of a, a torrified timber, um, which I produce myself. So it's, it's effectively oven baked with a lack of oxygen. Um, and then subsequently, it's infused, impregnated with epoxy, which is then cured. And it gives a really good kind of solid ebony-like structure. And, it, and largely, it's been very successful. Every now and then, because it's a small batch process that I've been doing myself, um, I've, I've had some mixed results, shall we say. I mean, I've carried on looking. I heard of this product called Rich Light. Um, and I've used it uh, over the last six months on several violins, and it's been fantastic. This is a piece of it here. It's about the same weight as ebony. It's maybe slightly duller in terms of ringing than ebony. Um, it's incredibly tough. It's probably... Well, it, it, I know from, from working it, it, it feels like it's harder than ebony. It, it works well and it takes a finish nicely. Uh, it's available like this. <laughs> so, um, you know, you can buy sheets of it. And I think it's absolutely fantastic. Now, I'll be completely open and honest here. I got in touch with Rich Light and said, guys, I think your product's amazing. I would like to do a video about it. Send me some stuff. So um, instead of the, the little pieces that I've been buying previously, they did send me that big board. So yes, there is, I, I just want to be completely open, but just in case anyone thinks there's a hidden agenda here, um, they didn't tell me what to say. The only reason I'm doing this is because I think it's great. Um, this is a violin I made a while back. And this violin has got a fingerboard of my torrified timber. There's nowhere under the strings. It looks great, but there is a problem. And that is just on this little bit there, it looks like it's breaking down. And so it's, it's kind of worn away. And I suspect that that was where, where the epoxy infusion, epoxy impregnation under vacuum didn't fully permeate the timber or where there was a spot that didn't get baked with the epoxy fully to the point where the epoxy hardened. I, I use this stuff on 20 odd violins, I guess, and I've had one or two problems with it. This is one of them. Um, and so, I'm going to take this fingerboard off and I'm going to replace it with a rich light one. violin is gonna watch this with absolute horror I will uh, I won't tell him <laughs> well I won't I won't I probably I won't release this video until everything's finished and he's happy and it's back in his hands and I'll, I'll let him see the full horror of what it's like having your violin ripped to pieces <laughs> scary stuff done on fiddle. Um, next, 
repair this, which means shooting one surface, getting the end true, making sure the overall length is right, um, then putting in some locating pins um, to the neck and also to the fingerboard so that it always goes back in the same spot each time. And then I will start, um, I'll make a nut blank and I will shape the fingerboard and the nut. Okay, so I've just put the little locating pins in, two new ones. Uh, I did that simply by taping a piece of paper onto this, putting it down on a flat surface, cutting the paper to size, then using a uh, braddle to, to mark uh, positions of those, taking the piece of paper off, using that same piece of paper to mark the holes on here, two millimeter drill for my toothpick and cut those, pop them in. And there we have it. Yep, happy with that. Just gonna make the blank for the nut, although I won't bother filming that. That's not gonna be terribly exciting, is it? So on we go. Um, yeah, I'm just about to mark up this fingerboard. I mean, basically you normally have about five, um, five millimeter flat on the edge of the fingerboard. So I will use a marking gauge to do that. It, it's um, 41 millimeter radius that way. I mean, a long time ago, I cut my first one of these and I sort of, uh, check the radius every now and then, but basically that, that I use as a guide to actually sort of get this um, to shape. Um, I do a lot of the work with planes, um, pairing chisels, whatever I fancy really, and, and that kind of depends on the, on the material I'm using. With this stuff it is a bit harder, so yeah, I'm still, I still haven't totally settled on, on, on how I'm gonna, on how I'm probably gonna do most of these, but uh, uh, so I'm finding my way a little bit because it's a newish material for me. Five mil flat, 41 mil radius. There is the oft talked about scoop a lot. So not only is it curved this way, but it also the neck, the rate, the fingerboard is, I exaggerate, but it's like that, um, except it's not even on the G string side, the lower, you know, the bass string side, it's got a greater movement than on the E string side, on, on the treble side. And generally, um, if you put a, a straight edge along there, you're looking for a gap in the middle about the same as the thickness of the string at that particular point, so to speak. So the thick strings on the bottom have a, you know, a generous sort of, probably, you know, just over about about one millimeter, probably or, or, or thereabouts. And as I say, a much much finer um, sort of scoop on the treble side. Again, think E string. So this board does that, and I'm trying to exaggerate this as I go. It will do sort of more down on that side. So does that make sense? <laughs> so it's quite a complicated shape, but it's quite easy to do. So there we are. Uh, that's what I'm going to be doing now. On we go. A long time ago I made this silly little jig um, for working on fingerboards. Um, I'm still using it. <laughs> so uh, the jointing surface down obviously. And that just pops in there. I've marked up the 5mm visible and this jig a long time ago got worn down beyond that. So I'll be working to the line on the blank rather than following the surface here. But it's a nice way of holding it anyway. And this material does work in a similar way to, to wood. It's it, um, you can use all your woodworking tools. You're probably going to have to sharpen them a little bit more and you're probably going to find it slightly harder work.
Well, I took a little while, so much so that uh, I managed to flatten the battery on the phone because <laughs> um, I do all this, most of the filming at the moment on, uh, on the iPhone. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, it needs sanding down. Um, I will uh, now do the scoop on the underside, I think, before I sort of finalise the shape on it. So, um, yeah, marking out and everything. Um, I'm, I literally just use the old finger rang against the side. I can see that. There we go. Basically, if you use your finger as a guide on anything, you just decide how far to project the pencil beyond that. So, I mean, I don't, for me, I don't bother doing anything more accurate than, than that for this sort of thing. And then draw... Draw a rough shape onto it for the scoop, and then similarly on the end here. So here we have it um, up to this point. Uh, basically, the it's it's within a gnat's on the curve and everything that can be done later when it's on the front because obviously gluing it on and so on will affect the shape of the neck and the fingerboard slightly, inevitably. Pegs will hold it in place. That brings the question of what glue to use. Um, I must admit I haven't experimented with many different types of glue for this material. Um, I'm going to be using a, a thick, a, a viscous super glue, um, which is something I use um, for a number of jobs. Um, and uh, there we go. Um, I'm going to be using a, a simple little vise set up in here to uh, to cramp it on in one go. Obviously, if you're going to use super glue, you need to have a fairly fast method of, of uh, clamping something up. Anyway, let me reset the camera. So here we go. Let's do it then. No mucking about when you use super glue. Uh, you've got to make sure you don't spill it all over your fingers, and you've got to work quickly. And you mustn't stick yourself down to anything. Uh, try not to touch your face whilst you're doing it, uh, in case you've got glue everywhere. Um, wear glasses. <laughs> and go, go, go. We're on. We're moving. So about the amount I think I need down. Spread it out. cyanoacrylate fumes rising already which means it's starting to go off and then yeah there we have it the um the fingerboard is is glued on, and I'm just uh, having a look and cleaning it up a bit at this stage. So, it's done. We've got the replacement fingerboard on the violin. And 
I mean, it just looks like a really high quality ebony fingerboard. It's sort of smooth. It's got that lovely homogenous kind of quality of ebony, but with a little, there's a little, a little movement, a little texture. You, you know it's not just a lump of plastic. And so it's got, it's got that sort of feel. And um, of course, what it sounds like and how, how it feels under the fingers is critical. So. You know it does already. Um, it's easily available. It's relatively cheap. It produces a really, really high quality product. Uh, it's able to be worked pretty much in exactly the same way uh, as you work ebony. And I think the owner of this violin will be absolutely delighted to have this, um, this fingerboard on here. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think I can make any plainer, can I? That's how I feel about it, but of course, make up your own mind. I, I mean, personally, I expect to see this sort of material, rich light, being used by an increasing number of, of small, you know, individual makers, you know, rather than uh, manufacturing companies, who many of whom are already already there. But uh, it's perfectly suited for use in a small workshop as well. Anyway, that's it from me. Look ourselves. Cheers, folks. Bye. <laughs>